Hi, uh, this is Kevin from uh, Skylum Software. Um, I'm coming at you from San Diego, California, and I'm delighted to talk to Simon and Lisa Thomas. So, uh, where are you guys uh, located uh, today? Right now, well, we're normally in some you know really exotic or hardcore adventures. Right now, we are in deepest, darkest Wales. <laughs> uh, we're back in the UK, which is a very, very, very rare thing for us. We've been traveling for. Uh, almost 15 years now, but we've just come back because Lisa's middle sister just got married. You could not miss that. So we're actually, at, we're actually in a cabin, in a little cabin in uh, the back of Lisa's mum's garden, and it is raining. But, but the cabin is beautiful because we're uh, very close to the mountains and very close to Snowdonia. So you can imagine the weather's a bit there. Yeah, fantastic. And I understand you've got the heater running and uh, it's climate controlled inside the cabin. There's no insulation. It is <laughs> raining like crazy, so we can barely hear ourselves and there is no heater whatsoever. So we're, oh, well. we're suffering. <laughs> we're, we're suffering. Yeah. Well, thank you, for su th thank you for suffering. Thank you. Thank you for suffering uh, uh, for this endeavor. Well, hey, today I, I really wanted to, uh, to, to, again, thank you for, uh, for um, you know, sharing some of your your photography with us. Uh, you guys are, are uh, world record holding motorcycle ad adventurers. Uh, I've known you for, gosh, almost 10 years now. And um, uh, I think that what we'd like to do this morning, uh, your evening, is uh, is really talk about some of the inspiration behind your photographs. Uh, you guys get to travel to amazing parts of the world that most of us can only dream of, uh, of visiting. Uh, and you're able to capture those unique moments, those those the slices of time, and uh, and we'd like to hear some stories about uh, about the images, the background, the inspiration, and uh, you know just uh, kind of be inspired alongside of you. How's that sound? Yeah, that, that, that sounds fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've got a, I've got a couple of images that I pulled to one side. Obviously, we knew we were going to have a chat. There you go. But well, obviously, we, we we knew we were going to have this uh, little video chat, and I was speaking to uh, to Michelle and I asked her. You know, do you have any particular uh, images of Lisa and myself riding? And instead of choosing one of the action shots, she actually pulled out this shot, which is Lisa and myself in the Bolivian Altiplano. Um, and it was it was a tough one to take, primarily because we're up at sixteen and a half thousand feet. We're at um, wow. a place called Laguna Edionda, which is translates as Stinky Breath Lake, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We, we got up at 5.30. We were going to have a big, long day. Uh, the little pink dots are actually flamingos. This I was going to ask you about that. A, well, this is a, a, a very salty piece of water. But it's also a breeding ground for flamingos. But it was 6, 6.30 in the morning. No coffee, which is never a good thing. <laughs> um, but the altitude also meant that it was below zero. We had every single wow. letter imaginable on. Mm -hmm. And I had a little, I had a new the time new Nikon D seventy S. Oh nice. Okay. And this was my this was my first uh digital SLR. Okay. Um and I think I had maybe ten seconds to <laughs> hit the button and then waddle <laughs> over the bike and unceremoniously unceremoniously rather try and get myself onto the bike. Mm -hmm. Um I think I think I had twenty one attempts <laughs> now, bearing in mind, by, by attempt 20, our marriage is now failing. We're arguing. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I want to go. Lisa said, no, it's worth it. So I have 20 shots from my foot or my ass. It's at some <laughs> point of elevated status. This was the only one that worked. Um, but it's actually one of our favorite shots. It yeah. just. I think it sums up our travels. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, fully, uh, fully loaded down and uh, and muddy, and muddy and cold. <laughs> I mean, we we literally carry everything we own in the world on us or with us on two motorcycles. That's so that's kitchen, camera gear, that's tools, repairs, uh, wow. camping gear, you name it. Everything we own is on those two bikes. So what I'd like to do now is just talk through uh, a little bit about the filters that I use to bring this image back to life and give it some impact. Uh, I'm using Luminar 2018. The edit was about 120 seconds, so two minutes, 
and I only use a total of nine filters, uh, which you can see on the right hand side. Now right now I've turned all the filters off, so they're still there, but they're not visibly active on the image. Now what I started with initially was going to the uh, Accent AI filter, so in other words the artificial intelligence filter. Uh, and effectively what I did was I boosted the filter to 100% strength and I would then normally back it off to the left. But I actually liked what the AI filter did straight away. That's Luminar's looking at the image, deciding what kind of image it is and using some pretty powerful algorithms to make specific changes to how it interprets the image. It did a fantastic job. Now because we were at altitude, the light was very light gray blue. So my next job was effectively to bring back a very small amount of warmth. And I used the golden hour filter and I've just increased the warmth overall globally to the image. The next thing I started looking at was the hue saturation lightness filter. Now I wanted to bring back some warmth to those hills, the foothills and some of the foreground. So using the saturation I increased the red and the orange and I very marginally increased the luminosity of the orange parts of the image. What I then did was use a mask just to apply those to the upper part of the image that you can see here. I still felt the clouds in the upper area were a little bit too bright, so using an adjustable gradient filter and a mask, I just darkened down the upper part of the image and I then also added a little contrast between the white and the blue sky using the polarizing filter. Again, up at around 33. I wanted to bring back some detail to Lisa and myself, the tires, some of the texture on the riding jackets, and so very carefully I brought in the detail enhancer, and I just made some adjustments to the very small details, the medium details, and nothing to the large. To make sure I didn't get any contrast uh, hot pixels um, to make sure that I didn't overcook it. I came into the detail enhancer and went to the blend mode and I set that to luminosity. Anyone that's familiar working with Photoshop, again when you apply any kind of sharpening, using that luminosity uh, blend option is a great way to go. I then looked at the highlights and I felt that the, there was some detail that I could bring back or rather that Luminar 2018 could bring back um, across the bikes, the shoulders um, of our jackets, the helmets etc. So bringing the highlights and shadows filters up I've just wound back ever so slightly the highlights. As far as the exposure I dialed it back ever so slightly Now, be careful when you're using the exposure slider it's very powerful I've just made a small adjustment but the impact's been sizable on the image. And then lastly, I've just given the whole image uh, a jolt in the arm, a boost by increasing the vibrance. And if I hit the icon at the top, you can see the before and the after. The difference is substantial and that was around a two minute edit. Now, um, now, did you did you have a, a formal uh, photographic education, or or had you played around with cameras much before you left on your on your worldwide adventures? Well, it's kind of funny you asked that because I said I want to take a camera. I want to take the best camera we can afford, which actually was nothing. So my parents bought us a camera before we left. It was a Fuji 3.2 megapixels. It wow. was the best on the market. Yeah. But prior to that, I'd just taken snapshots, you know, the normal holiday snapshots. It was my camera. And gradually, as we uh, had the months traveling, Simon would take it away from me. And uh, it, I don't know, you began to love taking the photographs, but he'd never taken a photograph prior to the trip. I'd never actually held a camera. Okay. I was one of those. I was one of those very strange. I was actually the anti-camera guy. Oh, really? What? Well, you know, what? I look back now and I, I don't understand it. But yeah, I remember very clearly being the guy that would say stupid things like, "Well, you've got the memory. You've been there. Why take a photograph?" And now, obviously, I'm a complete mm -hmm. and absolute convert. Um, <laughs> and yeah. you were asking earlier on about the, the passion behind the photography. And that really stems from a few things, but primarily we are absolutely passionate about traveling, about motorcycle travel, about getting out into the world. 
and seeing and, and experiencing things that Lisa and I genuinely thought were beyond us. Mm. It's, the, it's the kind of thing you see other people doing on TV. And then we find ourselves in these incredible locations wow. surrounded by the most amazing peoples and cultures. And to be honest, Lisa and I are then driven to try and capture and and share yeah. what we see as powerfully, as as potently as possible. And to do that, you, you become a better photographer. You, you learn you learn new tips and tricks. So the answer to the question is no. Neither of us have any formal training. Um, it's all just been through lots and lots and lots of errors and mistakes. And On the right job. now, we have. But we have 1.8 million images in our library from the last 15 years of travel. But honestly, I have, I have 10 times that of stuff that we've just thrown away, deleted, because they were just... Well, that's the wonders of digital, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Please, please tell me it's backed up in the cloud somewhere. <laughs> uh, not in the cloud, actually, but we do have a separate hard drive, which we now have. We never used to. For the first eight years, there was no backup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then we uh, then we became we got sponsored actually only, only last year by a, a New York based company called Glyph Tech. Oh, and wow. I'm sitting okay. here right now with mm. a ten terabytes of spinning disk with a backup. So geez, that's great. That's uh, that, was, that was pretty special. Again, we're never going to be able to repeat these images. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's I almost mean, and like again, you want to. Again, just wanna... bringing this bringing this back to Skyland. Uh, I had a really interesting chat with a guy online a little while ago. And it was the usual conversation about, well, you know, is editing necessary? Mm. Um, if, you're, if you're good enough to be a photographer, um, then you should be getting it right in the camera. And I, and I think I ended up saying to him, look, that's, that's a lovely thing if you're reading it in a book, but I live in the real world, and mm -hmm. I'm not an awesome photographer. I learn something every time I yeah. pick the camera up. But what that also means is that I now rely on software like Luminar 2018 to be able to go back and correct some of the mistakes whilst I was going through yeah. it was a very, very steep learning curve. I mean, some of the things that Simon's managed to do uh, with the editing uh, is to bring alive some of our early photographs when neither of us knew anything well, about like this, like this one. A, a photograph. Mm -hmm. and, and, and suddenly you're there and you're going, wow, that picture was just dark and dingy and maybe slightly out of focus and suddenly bow there it is as we saw it when we first started off wow astonishing astonishing well i, I have more uh i have more questions than we have time for so i'd love to see another uh image and see where that one takes the conversation okay beautiful well, um, beautiful here, here is a complete contrast um this is a temple uh in northern india North Northwest India. Uh, it's to the east of Lahore in Pakistan. We'd ridden through Pakistan with a fully armed escort, which was quite an experience. We'd arrived in India at the Wagga border, which is hotly contested. Uh, it's a very, very unusual place. Mm. And we'd ridden into Amritsar. Now, I always thought India was hot. I've only ever seen people going to India and, and sweating a lot. We got there. It was freezing cold. Oh, really? <laughs> Who knew? Um, and I, I did a lot of reading about the Golden Temple. Now, I can't pronounce its official name, but the actual, the actual Sikh name of this temple translates to the abode of God. Wow. That's um, appropriate. And I just... Well, and again, you can go online and there's lots of beautiful photographs uh, of this wonderful pool, these marble walls. It's very serene. But I, I, I'm always, we're always pushing ourselves to try and capture something a little bit differently. And I've never seen anyone try to capture this at very first light. So you have this very deep, eerie blue uh, just before sunrise. Wow. And then the sun peeks over these marble walls. And it just and hits. It's, the, the, the gold. I mean, this is encrusted with gold. This is this has 70, 750 kilos. I'm not sure what that is in pounds. It's a lot. 750 kilos of gold covering the temple. Jeez. And a lot of armed guards, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, they pretty tall guys. Also very tall Sikh. Sikh men with big spears. Okay, so let me walk you through some of those uh, filters that I've applied inside Luminar 2018 to make this image really pop. 
Well, the image started off as the raw file. You can see that on the screen. And I first went to the HSL filter, Hue, Saturation, Luminosity. And all I've done here, very simply, is increase the saturation of the orange, yellow, and blues, and also increased the luminosity of the orange, yellows, and a little bit of the aqua. I've also made the blues darker. Next up was a vignette. I was looking to draw the viewer's eye into the center of the image and placing a relatively strong vignette around the outside allowed me to do that. With the brightness and the contrast, I've simply increased both of those and then used a graduated mask to apply that effect with that filter just to the reflection down here. I can turn that on and off. Again, it's quite a subtle change, but an important one. Highlights and shadows, I wanted to bring a little more attention and just bring out some of those details in this close water area and the inside of the temple. If I just turn that filter on and off, you can see there's quite a change there in the center. Image radiance, I was looking to enhance the reflection in the water. I've only applied that to the reflection using a graduated mask but I also wanted to push back the details and soften these back buildings, especially in the corner. So I've used the soft focus. It's pretty subtle, but it's done a really nice job. HSL and the second HSL filter stacked down allowed me to make the darks, uh, the blues even darker rather, and the saturation just slightly less. You get these these changes were a lot more subtle, but effective nonetheless. And then lastly, uh, lastly, I went in and top and bottom lighting, which just allowed me to provide a very subtle uh, color change between this midnight blue over here and the royal blue here. Again, it's very subtle, and that's the idea. But when you combine all of those changes together, all those filters stacked on top, and I use the quick preview, you can see the change between the raw file and my finished piece. Wow. Was this an, was this a, uh, an HDR shot, or was this a single capture that you've then edited? No, this is, this is a single capture that I have then edited. Um, I did, I did bracket a lot of these shots. Um, again, I know my own weaknesses. It was very early in the morning. My brain's not firing. <laughs> no. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I've got the greatest possible chance of capturing at least one. Yeah. So I'm bracketing set seven or eight shots uh, yeah. in the hopes that one of those is going to work out well. I could HDR this a little bit, um, but then you have the issue of a little bit too much saturation. You start yeah. pulling that back. Yeah. And I honestly thought that with the background being so muted and it, it blurring so beautifully into that blue sky, I didn't think added detail was going to help. It was really yeah. this contrast between this, from the sun hitting the temple for the very first time uh, that day and this, and this milky blue. Yeah, no, it's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous shot. And, and you guys, uh, again, you get to travel all, you get to travel all over the world and find amazing places like this. Google helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be looking this, this up on Google Maps after the after the call. Well, th I was speaking to Michelle and she was talking about a lot of people right now um, on Skyland's social channels, Facebook, Instagram, etc., are sharing mountain shots. Ah. And so, um, you know, this particular shot, this is of the Annapurna Himalayas, and that big peak in the background is called Machu Picchu. Now, the, the better mm. known name is Fishtail, mm. because from the side, that's what it looks like. Believe it or not, this was taken from the front of our tent. Oh, wow. Okay. We were still in the sleeping bags <laughs> in the front of our tent, camped on the edge of a 2,000-foot drop, looking out towards this. We'd, we'd arrived the night before. We'd ridden our two motorcycles up through this field uh, to where we'd, we'd heard we could camp. And the only identifier for this location, this just a field, was this perfectly formed ancient oak tree. Oh, wow. So okay. we, we camp up, we get there the night before, it's pitch black. We've been in, we've been in uh, Pokhara in Nepal for about two weeks. It's been cloudy. We've not seen the slightest 
village of a mountain. We were both very, very upset, actually. We're like, oh, we come all this way. <laughs> oh, we're never going to see them. <laughs> Lo and behold, we, uh, a storm rolls, rolls through that night, wake up the following morning, and then we pull back the tent in the hopes of going out and you know, making some coffee and literally our jaws hit the floor. Wow. And this, is, this was our first taste of the Annapurna Himalayas. Okay, well, let's have a look at the edits and the uh, process for the uh, Annapurna Himalaya shot. Now, this particular image was probably the most complicated and detailed that I've edited of the images I'm sharing with you here. And sadly, we don't have time in this video to go through the entire process. Needless to say, what I've got here is six or seven various uh, layers. Each layer is an adjustment layer and each of these layers has anything from two to six filters applied to it. So very briefly if I show you the starting image I will show you where we finished up with. Okay there is the base image. Uh, completely wrong in the camera, little or no contrast, very overexposed and this took quite a bit of work to bring back to something that is acceptable. But Luminar 2018 has done a fantastic job. Now this entire edit is in 2018. It hasn't touched anything else. Now you have that detail, you have that, that, uh, that saturation, uh, you have some wonderful contrast. If I bring in the slider, I mean you can see the difference is absolutely vast and that's just how powerful this program is so just to run through briefly what I actually did was I created a luminosity mask and I basically completely separated this front foreground where the mountains and the trees and that back area so I was able to work on correcting and bringing back some detail and some warmth to the foreground and then working on the mountains in the background completely separately. Then using a few additional layers I applied global effects, for example the the fog effect that just again enables that degree of separation, it looks realistic. It was there in the photograph but it was so washed out I couldn't bring it back without being a little artistic. A very subtle vignette um, it's very easy to push the colours, push the saturation, and that's something I really didn't want to do. Um, there's some other tweaks I could make in this, but overall I'm generally happy when you look at where the image started from and where we ended up with, with the final click of the button. Wow, this, pretty is pretty a, cool. this is a fantastic shot. Well... Let's Again, see. I was I was looking I was looking through the social media uh, Skyland social media channels, and there are a lot of mountains. But what I was noticing was there were not there were not equal representation of portraits. Now, for me, I portrait photography is probably an aspect that that I enjoy the most. I actually think Lisa's portrait shots are better than mine. But part of that mm -hmm. is because I feel. I feel very uh, awkward about putting a camera in someone's face. It, to me, it's a very personal thing. I've got mm. other friends whose photographs blow me away, and they have no qualms of walking up to a stranger and just click, click, click. And sometimes I will think that it might be easier for a female because be. it, it's, it's less in your face. A, a guy coming up to you, a tall guy, Simon's six foot four, and coming straight at you with a camera, well, that's what it feels like. Whereas I'm small, I can maybe get closer and more sneakily and be a little bit more gentle about it and people are a, a bit more, more accepting, they're a yeah. bit more accepting for the female. Well, so there's an advantage for us, I think. Well, I, I, can, uh, I can imagine that depending on the cultures, that could be really, really uh, valuable. You know, you, you're, you're kind of, and, and this must have happened to you over the 15 or so years that you get to experience all these different cultures and you yourself have to be sort of malleable to the, to the, the local you know, people, and it's it's so interesting that you mention that because a camera in itself can utterly change the dynamic of of a meeting, be it whether it's an arranged meeting, a chance meeting, or a situation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I was doing some writing recently, and I was talking about you know the, the immediate change. So you see a group of children; they're playing. You have this you have this naivety in their faces, which mm-hmm. contrasts with the fact that perhaps they're you know in some horrible situation in a street in, in India. Um, you pull a camera out, a little point and click. They're curious. They're fun. You pull out a big digital SLR with a big lens. It's intimidating. Mm. Those childlike pieces of behaviour that were fascinating just disappear. Likewise, um, prime example: Iran. We were there for almost a month, and using a camera was a real risk because you're pulling up the camera to take a photograph of something. The next minute you're being arrested and escorted and it gets pretty serious from then on in. Wow. Because unbeknownst to you, there is a completely unmarked, nondescript government building in the background. And the ramifications of that kind of mistake, even if it was based on ignorance and naivety, are very, very severe. Yeah. Um, and there's also flip sides. Um, a camera, a camera in your hand, as long as you're respectful, gives you almost a Steven Spielberg degree of control. Ah. Our first night in Pakistan, there were these four guys, and they were different ages, and they were talking to us, and I said, hey, would you mind if I took your photograph? You know, first night in Pakistan, you know, and... I was getting I was getting a little frustrated that I, I couldn't get them where I wanted, and then I remembered I I heard somebody else mention the same thing, and I went, okay, well, I'll just take control because I'm the guy with the camera, I'm Mrs. Spielberg, and I physically were moving them around, getting them into the right place, moving them into the right location. Um, now I know for a fact that had I not had that camera in my hand, they wouldn't have allowed you to to move them about sure. like that to definitely. take that kind of control. Mm. Uh, so a camera like ultimately directory. affects each situation, especially when you've got yeah. different cultures involved. So let's have a look at the filter stack that I used in Luminar 2018 on this wonderful portrait of the old Indian guard. Now the initial concerns I had was there was a real yellow tint hue to the image. So the first thing I did is I went into the develop section and I basically adjusted the color temperature, the exposure, the contrast, uh, increased the highlights a little bit, uh, brought the shadows back very marginally. Uh, I also added a small amount of clarity. From that standpoint it was the HSL filter. Now I really wanted the yellow to stand out and I wanted a little more blue in the collar. So with the saturation I boosted that substantially uh, using the saturation slider and luminescence for orange and yellow have both been increased significantly. Top and bottom lighting, I basically felt that the lower half of the image, especially the moustache, his jawline and some of this texture on the collar needed uh, attention drawing to it. So I've done that very simply by adding, uh, where have we gone here, by adding uh, a little extra light to the bottom of the image and then I've used the uh, mask painted on just to select where that uh, extra light is added to and you can see it's made quite a significant difference to the bottom of that image there. Okay now I, f- I didn't feel that I could get the the color I would needed to uh, on the turban just with one hit of HSL hue saturation luminosity so I've gone back in I've reused that filter um, and what I've done here is significantly boosted those yellows again. Okay, well you can see here I've actually used the HSL filter a third time. But on this occasion, it was actually just to dial back a little of the orange saturation from just around the face. Uh, orange and yellows have been reduced in saturation. And you'll also notice, however, the luminosity of the orange I've bumped up just to get that texture in the face back to where I think it needed to be. Brightness and contrast. Again, a little extra brightness, a little extra contrast, and again, I've used a mask which I've painted on just to select portions of the face that I wanted to apply that filter to. Now, exposure. I've increased the exposure just slightly, and again, 
painted on mask just to bring out the highlights, eyes, iris, um, some of the edging of the moustache and the jawline. If I turn this on and off, you can see it's quite a difference up on the turban there as well. Um, coming towards the end here, I wanted the warm parts of this image to be a little warmer and the cooler parts of the image again a little a little cooler so again split color warmth very powerful filter uh, use it sparingly but it's done a great job of doing exactly what I needed to do the results are quite subtle but it does make a difference in the overall finished image a vignette here again just as a nice simple way of bringing everyone back to the center of the image detail enhancer I've used this towards the end and really I just wanted to bring out some of the detail in and around the nose, the eyes and this wonderful moustache and again I've used the paintbrush to paint onto the image the areas where I wanted. And lastly, really just to see what was going to happen, I've actually used the artificial intelligence filter as an end step whereas normally I would use it as a starting point. Um, I just wanted to see what it would do and it's just crisped the image up, it's just changed a few areas of the, uh, of the image in terms of shadow and highlights and I really like the results. Okay, if we come back up and we click the slider, you can see the difference again is pretty substantial. <laughs> this, this, this has been one of my favorites for years. Well, this is quite amazing. We're, we're just uh, 56 miles south of Alice Springs. Okay. Um, Which in, country? So we're in Australia, Alice Springs, in Australia. And uh, we had just been on a very long two and a half thousand mile off road route. And we were looking for somewhere to camp, but we didn't want to camp in Alice Springs, so we went further south to camp. And that area for that year hadn't had rain for 173 days. days. Oh, wow, okay. You could really feel the oppression. It was almost like there was a great big weight on our shoulders. It mm. needed to rain. Then we got there, set up our tents, and then suddenly we had not a downpour. It was a very light rain, yeah. but it lasted about 12 minutes. I think we danced about a lot in it. And suddenly we look over and we see a rainbow. And the strange thing is, this area is known as Rainbow Valley. Oh, wow. But it's not known for Rainbow Valley for the rainbows because hardly ever occurs. It's Rainbow Valley because of the colour of the rock formation. Again, this is this is a, mm -hmm. a sandstone buttress that just lifts straight out of the clay pan. Uh, and it's Rainbow Valley because of the colour of the rocks. So to have done two and a half thousand miles through <laughs> five deserts, got to the very centre of Australia, <laughs> uh, two hours north to an area that people typically don't visit, right. uh, south of Alice Springs, and then to have got 12 minutes of sprinkling rain after wow. 173 days of nothing. Right, well back in 2018, Luminar 2018, I'm going to step through and show you the filters that I chose to use on the Rainbow Valley image. Um, of all the images that I've shared with you today, this one probably required the least number of edits, but I was still surprised that I actually ended up putting four more edits in that I wasn't anticipating. Um, initially, it was very much a case of bringing back some of that contrast, and all I did to begin with was go in and add a small degree of contrast. My next edit was uh, split color warmth, just to bring back some punch to the orange clay. I took the warm elements of the image and just boosted those. Exposure, that was pretty straightforward, just a very gent gentle nudge to the right to increase the exposure. Now, the white and the blacks, the image didn't have as much saturation as I wanted. Now, I could have gone in and just used the saturation sliders, but what I've actually done here is I've boosted the blacks and I've increased the whites, which effectively has done the job in terms of the saturation. Hue, saturation, and lum luminance. Again, not a lot of change here, just some extra saturation in the blue, which generally affected the sky. And again, a small nudge to brighten up those blues again in the sky. If I turn this on and off, hopefully you can see some of those changes occurring. Now, the next edit was top and bottom lighting. What I did is substantially darken the foreground. 
um, in an attempt to push the viewer's eye closer towards the rock, and that's worked out pretty well. Image radiance, uh, again, pretty straightforward. I wanted just to soften and have the highlighted clouds just appear to glow a little bit, and that's a great filter to achieve that. And then last but not least was the Orton effect. Um, there was just a little too much separation between this orange rock and the darker skies. So by using the Orton effect, it's just provided a gentle glow and a softening to these edges. And then what I've done is I've actually used the paintbrush to add those details back in. So I've actually used the paintbrush to paint on the mask of where I wanted this filter to appear. Now the image... Uh, started off being relatively strong but if I hit the quick preview it's gone from being pleasant but not a lot of drama to having a lot more depth and a lot more saturation which I'm much happier with. Contrast is down because I know that I have more creative control and far more computing power to create the image that I saw on a laptop than I do mm -hmm. in a camera. Mm -hmm. So that's literally just the raw image and then with, I think this was probably about a dozen steps mm -hmm. and again, it was only that many steps in Luminar because I was doing things locally rather than globally mm -hmm. um, to what we actually saw. Yeah, and, and, and the, you know, I've actually never met anybody who turns everything off in camera. Uh, really? It, well, you know, maybe I'm not, I don't get around much, <laughs> but the, the thing that, you know, shooting raw, turning everything off and then really using the software as a digital dark room is a, yes. is a, I'm going to try that. That's a very, very interesting uh, approach to me. Well, I, I, mean, I just figured that the, the raw shots are, are your digital negatives. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, uh, whether it's see. whether it's Fuji, Nikon, Canon, there are a lot, a lot of profiles. You know, they apply they apply sharpening. They mm -hmm. whether it's lands, landscape mode or a film emulation mode, like right. like Fuji. I was using one of theirs recently. Mm -hmm. uh, all that's wonderful, but by turning it all off, I I get the the base image, and then it's down to me as the photographer to selectively choose how I want the viewer's eye to focus on what I'm shooting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the only ones I work on are the ones that I think are worth, are worth sharing. Yeah, oh, that's great. Uh, that is, that's, that's just, and the transformation from one to the other, from the original uh, to, to that is just stunning. The nice thing is that where, although Luminar and Photoshop give you the ability to add data that wasn't there, I've never found the need to, um, mm. certainly in the last four or five years. In the early years, yeah, you, you add in some extra saturation, you start playing around because you can. But going back to that less is more, um, it's just a case of bringing out what's already there. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of bringing out, uh, again, this, this. this particular set of photographs is India heavy. These beautiful ladies are wild tigers. Oh, boy. No, no zoo, no... Uh, no, 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 nothing between you and them. Nothing between us. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and so, I mean, are you on a road? And so, you stop and pull a pull the, the camera out of the tank bag. Yeah, we're actually just on a dirt track here. Mm. It was it was a car's width dirt track. Um, we we'd had probably two hours of driving around this area. Okay. Um, hadn't really seen much at all. Had almost given up, and we're heading back out. Um, and lo and behold, we actually saw several other people, and they've got their cameras out. And like, okay, what are they photographing? You know, another bird, maybe an <laughs> elephant. No, they were because they okay. actually camouflage themselves beautifully. I was going to say they're 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 really kind of blended into the background. You, I'm sure it wasn't uh, wasn't easy to pull that pull that out. No, we got some video too. And again, like any photographer will tell you, I'm desperate to go back because I think I shot this with a. This isn't. This was a. This was the AT four hundred, and recently I was just playing with the Fuji XT two, and I had a four hundred mm lens with a, you know, a doubler. Yeah, <laughs> that would have got pretty close. That would have gotten uh, eyelash close. <laughs> yeah, Probably. but these animals are just spectacular. And again, you know, talking to you now, going through these photographs, Lisa and I have lived more in the last. 50 years than we ever imagined we'd live in a lifetime. We left England in 2003, mm. pretty great. Uh, we, we weren't photographers. Uh, we weren't 
serious off-road riders. And in the last 15 years, we've, we've clocked up half a million miles. We've ridden through almost 100 countries on six continents. Wow. And do it all again, the good <laughs> and the bad, because you get to, you get to see, capture, and, and share yeah. this. So what uh, uh, what is uh, what's on the horizon for you guys? Uh, we've been uh, traipsing through some some inspirational images over the last few minutes and uh, really spectacular areas of the world. Uh, w what's next on your horizon? Well, when we first started off, we headed for Africa, hmm. and I have to say it's the most amazing continent. And if we, we had to pick a favorite, we would probably say Africa. It's not the okay. easiest. It's, it's, I think it's the hardest. Mm. It's, it's stunning, the most beautiful. Um, and we're returning to Africa. Oh, you are? Oh, wow. Yes. yes. Uh, this time with uh, better camera equipment and some video. A little uh, more riding experience. Yep, yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to catch all those images that we now go, Oh, my God, why didn't we do that? <laughs> um, and... and and get some riding in and actually know what we're doing on both the photography side of things and the riding side of things. Well, it's going to be a little different. So we're going to be uh, in Cape Town in January 2019. Okay. And a very good friend of ours owns one of the top most of the four companies in the world. So shameless plug now. They've asked us to lead uh, a two-and-a-half-week uh, two ride from Cape Town through South Africa Botswana, Zambia, wow. all the way to the foot of Victoria Falls. Wow. Um, and, we, and we've agreed, we've got people that have signed up, we're going to have an amazing journey. From there, uh, obviously people will fly back to their respective countries and Lisa and I are planning to then ride on up through Central Africa into Northeast Africa and then back into Europe. Wow. What a, what a trip. So, you, so you're basically going one way and when the tour ends, people are going to split off to wherever they live. And you're just yeah. going to keep on riding into the sunset. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty, pretty much. Wow. That sounded fantastic. <laughs> that was that was good. Fantastic. You enjoy yeah, uh, I believe you ride. A, yeah, I believe you ride a bike. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I do. I do get around a little bit on two there wheels. Is, there is space for you. <laughs> space just, available. Just, just, just putting out there. Yeah, you've got a camera. Well, so, that yeah, sounds like a blast. That's what's for us next. So we're um, pretty excited by that because we just we're just desperate to go out there with some good cameras and get some great shots. And and how long has it been? Literally, has it been that was your first trip in two thousand three, and you haven't been back to Africa since? I've been back to no. Africa since. We oh. had we've had fifteen continuous years on on the road. Lisa came back to the UK uh, seven years ago. Uh, her father sadly passed away. Um, mm. We're back here right now. It's very, very strange. Uh, we've been back here just for a few weeks for yeah. a family event, um, mm. just because it, it, it was time. But we do feel very much like uh, tourists in our own country. That and that, that's also that. a nice thing. Yeah. The things that we always took for granted about being British, about the UK, we are now realizing um, has a lot, lot more value. Uh, but it's, it's actually 13 years since we left Africa. So yeah. we, we arrived there at the end of 2003 mm. and left uh, mid-2005. You know, that, 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 that time scale that you guys uh, uh, regularly recount here is just, I can't even fathom it. I mean, to literally spend, you know, 18 months in a place learning every uh, learning everything you can about it and traveling and experiencing the cultures that's just that's a hell of a vacation except it's not a vacation is it yeah <laughs> it's a lifestyle that's, that's, that's what we're putting that's what we're, i mean the reality is i mean you know we've spoken a few times um the first the first year and a half i think was a vacation um the only thing that matched our our naivety and our ignorance about what we were trying to do was our optimism <laughs> That's a great thing. and as time went on because we were initially we were, we said we were going to travel for a year maybe a year and a half right. nobody in their right mind <laughs> says let's go and travel you know for the next 15 years and live in a tent it's a great tent it's yeah. still a tent yeah uh, still but for Lisa, and, for Lisa and myself it's, 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 it's the become, right choice and now it's become our norm Right. Yeah. It's the new normal. Living in tents and being on our bikes and just having little equipment with us. It, it's it's mm -hmm. our lives. We're, we're richer for it. We're, we're far better people. Um, mm -hmm. We're far more aware as to 
where our limits lie, what mm. we're capable of. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's a truism, but we've set out to discover the world, and, and we've done a lot of that. Um, it has been remarkable, but I think I think now and again, Lisa and I realise how much we've learned about ourselves along yeah. the way, and that I don't think we were really expecting, or certainly we weren't focusing on. You know, we've got a love for travel and yeah. a love for photography because of the need to share what we're seeing and what we're trying to get across is, look, Lisa and I nothing special. We're not, we're not wealthy. We're not trust fund kids. No one's paying for this. Mm -hmm. We make a lot of sacrifices and commitments. And we had no special skills Training. when we started off. Mm -hmm. And if we can do this, then to a larger or lesser degree, anybody can, can do this. Um, it's just a case of taking that first step yeah. and then and then make and then making the effort. Right. And that's really and what being it's committed, about. being yeah. committed and passionate. That's right. Uh, that's right. When you're committed and passionate about something, providence somehow seems to move in your direction. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like Gary Player said, the, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. <laughs> that's right. I read something the other day that said, you know. Uh, that sort of confirm the, that having an optimistic viewpoint uh, tends to attract luck to one uh, oneself. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah I, pretty, pretty much. And people also, I, I was speaking to somebody else last year, um, and this is somebody who does an awful lot of motivational talking, hmm. and he said to me something that raised from a chord, because I was, I was saying, you know, what do you talk about? How do you make your money? How do you inspire people? And he said, well, ultimately, people are drawn to me for one singular reason. Then, and it's not, it's not the subject that I'm talking about. It's the fact that I have a degree of conviction that allows me to go out and mm -hmm. accept that certain things are going to fail. Ah, oh, okay. Said, that, mm -hmm. that sounds backwards. What do you mean? He said, well, if I accept that certain things are going to fail, by the same so token, certain things are going to work out great. And then the things that work out great, <laughs> I'll probably carry on doing because I'm, en I'm enjoying those. But the thing yeah. is just to put things into action, yeah. just to make a start. And from that standpoint, people see you as successful. Mm -hmm. And whether it's family, photography, work, we all want to have some degree of success. So we're drawn to people who seem to have this secret remedy where they're successful. And you know what? A lot of these guys are just taking ideas, but they're turning them into action and turning them into some kind of reality. And we interpret that as success. Yeah. And like you say, uh, having the it, conviction to do that. Yeah, that's, that's really what it's about. And understanding that certain things aren't going to work out. And when they don't, stop doing them and refocus. Hey, guys, it's been, I know it's getting late there in the UK. It's been an absolute delight for me to be able to talk to you again. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> I'm never tired of it. <laughs> and uh, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll find a way to get to uh, get to Cape Town in, in January. That would be a uh, that would be a real treat. That would be spectacular. <laughs> well, I know we were talking yeah. just before we came on, um, so it's worth mentioning now for anyone that is interested in our photography or just some of the places we get to. Um, we work with uh, Skylum uh, this year, and we produced a free ebook called Capture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has some of our favorite destinations in the world. So if anyone's interested in downloading that, that would be fantastic. It's a free ebook. If they go to toridetheworld.com, so that's the numeral two, ridetheworld.com, there's a very simple search facility. Type in the word capture, yep. C-A-P-T-U-R-E. And go and get the ebook. Hopefully, get inspired and go and visit some of these amazing places. Yeah, it's. A, I, I'm really glad we had the opportunity to work on that project. It's it's 12 epic locations, and if you've liked this back and forth and the inspiration and the story behind the photographs, this ebook is just chock full of that. And um, I, I think uh, anybody uh, downloading it and perusing it will really um, really enjoy the experience. Well, thanks once again, guys, and um, we we'll hope to see you on the road real soon now. Hope so. <laughs> that will be fantastic. Kevin, thanks. Okay. great thanks talking to you, and uh, thanks for an awesome piece of software. We'll catch you soon, buddy. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, Bye now.